This episode was suggested by Alan P. on Facebook. If you'd like to make a suggestion or ask us a question, you can contact us on facebook.com slash morbidcuriositypodcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast continues to be sponsored by audible.com. If you're busy like me, but you still want to read up on all sorts of morbid history or keep up with the latest science fiction and fantasy writers, Audible is the way to go. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to these audiobooks on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players while you work, cook, on your commute, or at the gym. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial by going to www.audibletrial.com slash mcp. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. I have some recommendations for books you can find about today's topic, but I'll get into that later. For now, on with the episode. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. This interest in disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. In 1872, New York City was an interesting and dangerous place to be. The American Civil War had ended in 1865, seven years before, but the city was still in turmoil. The Orange Riots occurred in July 1871 and 1872, in which Catholic Irish people attempted to stop Protestant Irish people from celebrating the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, a battle from 1690 between the deposed King James II of England and Dutch Prince William of Orange, who, with his wife Mary II, his cousin and James's daughter, had assumed the throne of both England and Scotland in 1688. The riots resulted in over 33 deaths, with many others wounded. Not only was there violence, but the poor living conditions in the city made it a horrible place to live for anyone who wasn't in the upper echelon of society. Multiple epidemics swept through the city's slums and tenements, including typhus, cholera, diphtheria, and tuberculosis. Horse manure covered the streets, as cars were not yet a common occurrence. Dead pigs and other livestock carcasses remained on the streets for weeks, as there was no infrastructure to remove them. In winter, when all the grime that lined the street had frozen, walking on the sidewalks was a particularly dangerous and disgusting challenge. Pioneer photojournalist Jacob Rees documented the poor conditions of immigrant tenement dwellers in his 1890 photographic collection, How the Other Half Lives. In the fall of 1872, a plague swept through the horses across New York City, leaving 15,000 horses dead or unfit for use. While the city was no stranger to disease-inflicted horses, the magnitude of the outbreak was unprecedented. At the time, most of the city was powered by horse-pulled coaches and streetcars. On top of this, horses were also responsible for transporting raw materials and merchandise, all of which had to be shut down on account of their illness. Almost all the stage lines were suspended or saw significantly reduced schedules. Additionally, the express companies responsible for the city's deliveries were either closed or scaled back. However, the 1870s were the beginning of the Gilded Age for the city's more prosperous inhabitants. New York became the financial capital of the nation after the Civil War, thanks to Wall Street and having the largest port and shipping industry in the country. Department stores were a new and progressive institution which gave women a chance to work for themselves. Architecture was reaching new heights both literally and artistically. Opulent balls were held by the city's richest residents, Central Park became a place that rich New Yorkers displayed their wealth by driving around in their expensive black carriages, which were so expensive only 5% of people living in the city could afford them. Crowds of poor New Yorkers watched as the rich ritually drove by in the afternoons. The rift between rich and poor was stark. 
Ocean-going steamships and steam-powered railroads, which had developed earlier in the century, were taking over most long-distance transport, bringing an ever-increasing stream of immigration and industrialization. While the rich paraded their wealth, many of the immigrants and factory workers were just scraping by, and many others took to begging in the streets. It was in this climate of disparity and the hope of a better future that a group of businessmen led by James Winchester, bought a ship they hoped would bring them good fortune, the Mary Celeste. Winchester bought the ship from Richard W. Haynes, who had spent $9,000 refitting the ship and changed its name from Amazon to Mary Celeste. However, the refit had cost Haynes dearly. The ship was seized by Haynes' creditors to pay his debts before Winchester bought it. Winchester saw potential in the Mary Celeste, and decided to further refit and enlarge the small brigantine ship, spending $10,000. He then sold shares in the ship back to Haynes, and also to the captain he hired to run the ship, a young, well-respected man named Benjamin S. Briggs. Briggs was in his late 30s and married to a woman named Sarah. They had two children, seven-year-old Arthur and two-year-old Sophia. He was a quiet man, but intelligent, active, and a very devout Christian with high morals. Briggs was also an experienced sailor, and was so confident in the ease of his first journey ahead that he felt safe bringing his wife and daughter with him. Briggs arrived in New York a week before his wife and daughter were due to arrive. In this week, he was to select a crew and fill the Mary Celeste's hold with the chartered cargo, 1,700 barrels of industrial alcohol, also known as denatured alcohol headed for Genoa, Italy. Industrial or denatured alcohol is ethanol that's had chemicals added to make it poisonous if ingested. It's used as a solvent and as fuel for alcohol burners. In this undrinkable state, it's also inexpensive and less of a risk to ship, which is why it's used for industrial projects. The Mary Celeste was docked at New York's Hunter's Point at Pier 44 on September 5, 1872 after making a short trip to Puerto Rico to test its seaworthiness. After viewing the ship in its docking, Captain Briggs had it moved to Pier 50, stating that the cargo was too large to load at Pier 44. On October 30th, cargo loading began and finished on November 2nd. During the loading process, a poorly loaded bundle of barrels fell onto the deck of the ship, crushing one of the two lifeboats on board. Briggs communicated to Winchester the need for a replacement, but this never happened. The second task Briggs had to complete was to hire a crew. The Mary Celeste only required seven crew members, as it was a smaller ship. It was classified as a half-brigantine due to its two different types of sails. One mast had triangular sails, and the other had square. For the role of first mate, Winchester suggested Albert G. Richardson, a man who had worked for him for two years and was described as sober and trustworthy. He was also married to Winchester's niece. The rest of the crew was made up of experienced American sailors and several for hire foreign sailors. Insurance for the ship and its cargo to sail on a routine shipping contract was set at $3,400. On October 27th, Sarah Briggs and Sophia arrived and took up residence with the captain in his quarters aboard the Mary Celeste. Stan Mason, a historian, wrote that Sarah Briggs was not satisfied with the small size of the cabin and unsure if it was wise to travel with her husband, though she had done so many times before. She was also sad about leaving her son, Arthur, behind with Briggs's mother, but she wanted him to finish school and so the separation was a necessary evil. Every night, Captain Briggs retired to his cabin to dine with his family and spend time with them. The only exception to this pattern was the night before the Mary Celeste was due to leave for Genoa. That night, Briggs dined with David R. Morehouse, the captain of the De Gratia, a ship that was docked next to the Mary Celeste and was also bound for Genoa with a cargo of petroleum and was due to leave eight days after Briggs. According to Mason, the two men ate at Astor House, a nice restaurant in the city. They were friendly, and it was not their first meeting. They talked of the weather, their cargo, and the capability of their vessels. 
Briggs, a usually sober man, had a single drink with his friend, and then both men departed for their own vessels to sleep for the night. The Mary Celeste began her journey the next morning on the 5th of November, but soon after departing, Briggs decided the misty weather and heavy winds were too risky to travel in, so the ship moored at Staten Island, a mere mile away from the harbor. Here, Sarah wrote a letter to Briggs's mother, stating that the crew seemed peaceable and that Arthur should write to her as often as possible. On the 7th of November, the Mary Celeste left Staten Island only two days late on departing. The de Gratia left on the 13th of November, its scheduled departure date. Captain Morehouse and his crew's journey was uneventful until December 4th, when they spotted a ship floating erratically in the sea 400 miles off the coast of Portugal, an area known as the Azores. Morehouse recognized it as the Mary Celeste. After watching it for a long time and deciding it must be in some kind of distress, Morehouse sent two of his own crew over to the Mary Celeste the next morning. Crew members DeVoe and Wright made their way over to the Mary Celeste in the lifeboat. Once they boarded, they found the ship with only half its sails flying, but in otherwise good condition. There was no weather damage, no trace of a struggle, and no trace of any crew or captain. They were simply not on board. Most of their personal items were left in their rooms, save the captain's navigational equipment and many of the ship's papers. The single remaining lifeboat was also gone. The cargo and several months of provisions were still on board, although a few of the barrels of the industrial alcohol were empty, possibly due to leakage through the wood of the barrels. The ship's pump was dismantled, and a makeshift sounding rod, an instrument used to determine water depth, was found on deck. The cargo hold held some water, but not enough to fear sinking. The cabins were also wet, seemingly due to weather coming through the skylights. Otherwise, the ship was in reasonable order. The last entry in the ship's logbook was from November 25th at 5 a.m., and it recorded the Mary Celeste's position as 300 nautical miles from the location the De Gratia found it. Where had the crew gone? Why had they abandoned a ship in good working order? This mystery would inspire years of speculation and hundreds of theories as to the cause of the crew's disappearance. These theories range from natural disasters, pirates and the fear of sinking, to alien abduction, but the real answer is as elusive as the missing crew. Confused about what had happened, but not about to let a good ship go to waste, Captain Moorhead and the crew of the De Gratia decided to tow the ship to Gibraltar, a British territory on the tip of the Iberian Peninsula, as salvage. It was not uncommon for ships to be abandoned in the 1800s and early 1900s. Without modern technology and safety measures, incidents occurred more often and were harder to recover from, sometimes leaving ships abandoned at sea or near shore. Under maritime law at the time the Mary Celeste was found, a person who salvaged an abandoned ship could earn a substantial share of the combined value of the ship and its cargo by bringing it back to land. The exact amount of reward was determined by a vice admiralty court hearing. Admiralty courts were juryless courts that held jurisdiction over local legal matters that related to maritime activities such as shipping. Even at the time, these courts were unpopular due to the lack of a jury and the inherent confusion between maritime law and common law courts. They were thought to be ineffective and unjust. However, the reward for bringing an abandoned vessel into port was often great, and so these courts were often used despite the confusion. The hearing for the Mary Celeste began on December 17, 1872. The Chief Justice presiding over the hearing was Sir James Cochrane, a former Attorney General of Gibraltar. The judge conducting the hearing was Frederick Solly Flood, the current Attorney General of Gibraltar. According to historian Paul Begg and historical mystery researcher Lionel Fanthorpe, Flood was a man who grew from obscurity and squandered his fortunes. 
He was the son of a fishmonger who inherited estates from his grandfather. He rose to become a member of the king's council, but his gambling problem lost him his legal practice and forced him to accept a position in the admiralty courts as attorney general of Gibraltar. He was described as arrogant and pompous, without much intelligence. He was also known to be stubborn to a fault. Both members of the de Gratia crew that had gone over to the Mary Celeste testified at the hearing, and then the de Gratia went on to complete their contract and deliver their cargo, with DeVoe in charge, while Morehouse stayed to finish the trial. Something about DeVoe and Wright's testimonies made Flood suspicious that a crime had been committed. The periodical New York Shipping and Commercial List picked up on this suspicion and on December 21st published a statement saying Flood believed there had been foul play somewhere along the line and that alcohol was at the bottom of it. On December 23rd, the Mary Celeste was examined by John Austin, the surveyor of shipping for Gibraltar, and a diver, Ricardo Portunato. During this investigation, several cuts on the side of the bow were noted as well as several red stains on the captain's sword, which was found sheathed under his bed. They ruled out heavy weather thanks to the presence of a jar of sewing machine oil that was found upright in its place, ignoring the fact that the ship had been boarded, sailed, and docked by the de Gratia crew, who may have moved things since the ship was found abandoned. A group of Royal Naval captains also examined the ship and endorsed the view that the cuts on the bow were deliberate, they also found several more dark stains on the ship's rails that they thought might be blood, along with another cut on the rail they proposed had been caused by an axe. All of these opinions strengthened Flood's theory that foul play was involved. On January 22, 1873, more than a month after the hearing had started, Flood sent his report to the Board of Trade in London, a British government department in charge of commerce and industry. He concluded that the crew had got at the alcohol and murdered Briggs' family in a drunken frenzy. He believed that they then cut the bow, hoping to simulate a collision, and fled to an unknown fate. He also felt that Morehouse had somehow doctored the Mary Celeste's logbook in order to hide something, thinking the ship could not have traveled so far out by itself. As you probably already noticed, in all of his accusations, Flood seems to have ignored many facts about the state of the ship and its cargo, such as the poisonous nature of the alcohol and the mostly tidy nature of the cabins. Winchester arrived in Gibraltar on January 15th, hoping to find out when the ship would be released to deliver its cargo. However, Flood demanded $15,000 in order to do so, an outrageous sum. He also insinuated that Winchester had deliberately engaged a crew that would kill Briggs as part of some conspiracy. A conspiracy to what exactly was not specified. Around this time, a scientific analysis of the stains aboard the ship and on the sword declared the substance was not blood. At the time, early scientists could identify a substance as blood even though they could not yet identify which type or do any sort of DNA testing. Therefore, we can at least rely on their ability to know the substance was not blood. The American consul in Gibraltar, Horatio Sprague, commissioned his own investigator, a captain of the U.S. Navy named Schufelt, to look into the Mary Celeste case. Schufelt examined the marks on the bow of the ship and stated that they were not man-made, but due to normal wear and tear from the action of the waves against the timbers of the ship. With nothing concrete to support his claims, Flood was forced to release the Mary Celeste from the hearing on February 25th. Two weeks later, a crew led by Captain George Blatchford from Massachusetts was hired to complete the contract and sail the cargo to Genoa. The matter of the salvage payment was finally decided on April 8th and paid out a mere $1,700, one-fifth of the value of the ship and the cargo. This amount was far lower than what was expected, given the insurance and the hazard of bringing the ship in. Chief Justice Cochrane's statement on the matter remained critical of Captain Morehouse for sending the de Gratia on with DeVoe in charge to deliver its cargo while the trial was still going on. This suspicious result of the trial made Morehouse and his crew forever suspects of foul play in the mind of the public. In effect, it ruined their reputations and their livelihoods. 
Since the end of the trial, many theories have circulated, both at the time and more recently. Some of the more outlandish theories involve pirates, the murder of all by one of the crew, possibly even Briggs himself, and alien abduction. Some even blame the Bermuda Triangle, despite the fact that the Mary Celeste was found nowhere near the vicinity of the Triangle. This last theory, as I mentioned in the MCP's episode about the Bermuda Triangle, may have spurred from confusing the Mary Celeste with the sinking of a paddlewheel steamer called the Mary Celestia, which left Bermuda for North Carolina, struck a breaker, and sunk just off the southern coast of Bermuda in 1864. The theories revolving around mutiny may have sprung from a story written in 1884 by none other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame. The interest in the story of the Mary Celeste was just quieting down when Doyle wrote the fictional account of the sole survivor of the Mary Celeste incident called J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement. The story was published in Cornhill Magazine, and while some of the details were changed, such as the name of the ship being Marie Celeste, the story was written so convincingly that Sprague, the U.S. Consul of Gibraltar, contacted Conan Doyle to find the source of the account. In Conan Doyle's story, a fanatic passenger named Septimus George convinced everyone else to murder the captain and divert the ship to West Africa. Because of this story, many people get the name of the Mary Celeste wrong. Even before Conan Doyle's story came out, however, several sources invented details to make the story of the ship even more mysterious. In 1883, the LA Times retold the story, adding embellishments, such as the sails all being unfurled, a fire in the grate of the captain's cabin, the galley table set with food, and the ship's log written to within hours of discovery. In 1906, Overland Monthly and Out West magazine changed the location of the ship's discovery to Cape Verde Island, 1,400 nautical miles south of its actual location of discovery. The story also changed Briggs to the first mate instead of the captain. In 1913, The Strand magazine published the tale of another alleged survivor, an Abel Fosdyke, who was supposedly the ship's steward. This fictional tale had the entire crew eaten by sharks when a temporary platform they had built to watch a swimming competition collapsed. The details were again wrong, calling Briggs Griggs, calling the captain of the De Gratia Boyce, and little Sophia being seven instead of two. The account also had no grasp of nautical language, further exposing it as a fake. Numerous other fictional survivor stories came out in the 1920s, all playing with different ways the crew could have disappeared, including murder, the discovery of gold, and the entire crew being picked off one by one by a giant squid. In the 1930s, there were radio dramas and a film produced by Hammer starring Bela Lugosi called The Phantom Ship or The Mystery of the Mary Celeste. In 1938, a short film called The Ship That Died dramatized a range of theories, and in 1980, the TV program In Search Of made an episode about the ship. Hundreds of books have been written, both exploring the more supernatural ideas about the disappearance of the crew and more fact-based analyses, with historians and researchers trying to use modern techniques to discover what happened. I recommend Mary Celeste, The Greatest Mystery at Sea by Paul Begg, The Mary Celeste, Legend, Evidence, and Truth by Stan Mason, and The Mystery of the Mary Celeste, the History of the American Merchant Vessel and the Disappearance of Its Crew by Charles River Editors. This last one you can find on audible.com. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, just for MCP listeners, audible.com is offering a free audiobook download and a 30-day trial. You can download any audiobook from their massive collection to keep for free, whether or not you keep the service, by going to www.audibletrial.com mcp. You're going to want to keep it, though, because there are so many awesome audiobooks on there. Once again, that's www.audibletrial.com mcp to get your free 30-day trial and free audiobook. Getting a free trial also supports the MCP, so I highly recommend it. One of the widespread theories about the Mary Celeste that has arisen from actual fact is that the ship was cursed from the beginning. 
It's true that many incidents have occurred aboard the ship, both before and after she was found abandoned in the Atlantic Ocean. On its maiden voyage, the ship was called the Amazon and was a little smaller than it was when the crew disappeared three years later. The captain, Robert McClellan, grew ill and died not long after setting sail. Another man, Parker, took over and completed the first commercial voyage bringing timber from Nova Scotia to London. The ship hit a bundle of fishing equipment off the coast of Maine and had to pause to make repairs. Then, when they reached the English Channel, the ship hit another brig and sunk it. Again, they paused to repair the damage and continued on. A year later, the ship ran aground in a storm and was so badly damaged that the current captain, a man named Thompson, abandoned it. A man called Alexander McBean then bought the wreck, sold it to another man who then sold it to Haynes, who renamed the ship Mary Celeste, and we know the story after that. After the salvage hearings, the Mary Celeste continued to have bad luck. Because of her mysterious reputation, the ship was unpopular and had trouble finding shipping contracts. It was sold in 1874 to another New York business partnership. The ship ran shipping routes mainly in the West Indian and Indian Ocean, all the while losing money for the company. In February 1879, the ship was reported at St. Helena Island when its captain, Edgar Tuthel, needed medical attention. He died on the island further increasing the belief that the ship was cursed. The Mary Celeste was sold again in 1880 and captained by Thomas L. Fleming until 1884. There are no records of voyages during this time, but historian Brian Hicks believes Fleming tried hard to make the ship profitable. In 1884, a new captain named Parker conspired with a group of Boston shippers to commit insurance fraud. They filled the Mary Celeste with worthless cargo and insured it for $30,000, which is $800,000 in today's money. They set out for Haiti and purposefully wrecked the ship in a well-charted reef. Insurers saw through his claims, and Parker was charged with willfully casting away a ship, a crime that at the time warranted the death penalty. He was also charged for conspiracy, and the conspiracy case was heard first. But the jury couldn't agree on a verdict, worrying they might prejudice Parker's shipwreck trial result. Eventually, the shipwreck charge was deferred, and Parker was allowed to go free. His reputation, however, was ruined, and three years later he died in poverty. One of his co-conspirators went mad, and another committed suicide, even further expanding the thought that the ship was cursed. Another theory is that the disappearance of the crew was actually part of another curse, the curse of Sophie Briggs, Captain Briggs' mother. She had four sons and a daughter, all who lived a life at sea. Captain Briggs mysteriously disappeared. Another son, Oliver, drowned when his ship capsized. Another died of yellow fever while at sea. Her daughter died when her ship collided with a rock. And her last son, Nathan, was struck by lightning leaving Sophie Briggs alive, having lost all of her children. Another widespread theory is that the disappearance of the crew and finding of the abandoned ship was part of a conspiracy to commit insurance fraud that went terribly wrong. At the time of the trial, many people thought the ship had been overinsured by Winchester, and that was evidence he planned to abandon it from the start in order to claim back on that insurance. But after examining the cargo, it was determined that the ship was not overinsured. It's also thought that perhaps Morehouse and Briggs conspired somehow. In this theory, it seems like too much of a coincidence that the two men were docked next to one another, and that they met the night before the Mary Celeste was to set sail, and that she waited for two days before truly leaving, and then the de Gratia of all ships found the Mary Celeste after she was abandoned. This theory loses weight, however, when we remember the two ships were already due for similar journeys, and the de Gratia left eight days after the Mary Celeste. If the two men had wanted to make sure the de Gratia found the Mary Celeste, Morehouse would have left sooner, being that his ship was the slower of the two. Also, the friendship between the two men is unsubstantiated. They were more likely acquaintances rather than friends. If they were conspiring, why not choose a method that drew less attention than a mysterious disappearance? 
if they were using the mystery to distract from Briggs quietly disappearing to find a new life somewhere on the coast, why did he leave Arthur behind? As for the idea of pirates abducting Briggs and his crew, there were some groups of Riffian pirates active off the coast of Morocco at the time the ship was found. However, pirates would never leave a ship full of supplies and cargo. They would have looted the ship before abandoning it, or taken the entire ship itself. A more extreme theory holds that Briggs, in a religious mania, threw everyone on board off the ship and then jumped off himself. This theory was proposed by Gilbert Lockhart in 1906 and has since been withdrawn as it was completely baseless. Oliver Cobb, Captain Briggs' cousin, proposed that perhaps the entire crew moved away from the ship in the lifeboat for some reason of safety and became lost at sea. He points out that the state of the rigging of the ship might indicate that the lifeboat was set out while purposefully attached to the ship so that they could return after the danger had passed. Things like fumes from alcohol, an explosion, or perhaps a fear of sinking could have led the crew to abandon ship temporarily. Paul Begg, however, points out that if there were any danger on board, the crew wouldn't have wanted to stay attached to the ship. Also, Briggs wasn't known as the panicky type. He would have known that even if there was danger of fire or explosions, the crew had a better chance of survival if they stayed on board, rather than fending for themselves with no provisions in a lifeboat in the middle of the ocean. Most historians agree, however, that something extraordinary must have occurred for Briggs to abandon a perfectly good ship. At the time of the hearing, DeVoe, the man from the DeGratia crew, said he found a makeshift sounding rod on the deck. At the time, he suggested that perhaps the crew had taken a measurement that gave a false impression of sinking, thanks to the ship's pumps being broken. The hold was so packed with cargo, it would have been impossible to tell by sight how much water was really in it. One explanation for the water in the hold might be a water spout. A water spout is a tornado over the sea. Some look like regular tornadoes, while others are nearly invisible. A water spout could have struck the ship soaking it and damaging the sails. The low pressure accompanied by a spout could also drive water up into the ship's pumps, leading the crew to believe the ship was sinking. Historian Paul Begg proposes that perhaps, after days without wind, the ship drifted quite close to the Dolaborat Reef, which surrounds the island of Santa Maria near the ship's last recorded location. Fearing the ship would run itself aground, as without wind the crew had no control, the crew launched the lifeboat and piled in, hoping to reach land. The wind could have then picked up and blown the ship back out to sea and swamped the lifeboat. However, there are issues with this theory. If the ship was waiting to catch a breeze, the sails would have all been unfurled, and when the Mary Celeste was found, only half the sails were open. Another theory suggests a sea quake could have shaken the ship so roughly toxic fumes from the industrial alcohol might have been released. Fearing an explosion, or perhaps just wanting to get off the ship until the fumes cleared, Briggs and the crew abandoned ship. It was a known occurrence at the time that ships could explode due to fumes. Cobb was also a strong proponent of this theory. He felt his cousin must have heard the rumbling, and perhaps an explosion caused the evacuation. But there were no signs of an explosion when the ship was examined during the hearing. In 2005, Channel 5 in England explored this theory further. Andrea Sella of the University College London built a model of the ship's hold using paper cartons as cargo barrels. Using butane, an explosion was created that produced a huge fireball, but no actual damage. It was more of a pressure wave explosion, and not even a hint of soot was left behind. So it's possible, but there is still no way to prove this theory as is the case with all the other theories. This is why the Mary Celeste holds our attention. The mystery has no solution, and we may never find one. We cannot prove or disprove any theory, either logical or outlandish, but still we keep looking and we keep wondering. The incident also evokes humanity's most primordial fear of the sea, of slipping beneath the waves and leaving no trace behind. That is why it draws out our curiosity. The 
The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show, at Morbid Podcast, or find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Troy, Jen, Heather C., Lena, Justine, Yank, Cooper, Paul S., and Becky for their comments and suggestions on Facebook. Thank you to Phoebes 1972 Allison, and Stacy for recommending the MCP on Twitter. A big thank you to Rocketsgram, Resaw 2011, and Stanford Newbie for your reviews on iTunes. Thanks to you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? Your gifts go to the research materials we use to create this podcast. A huge thank you to our repeat donator, Kevin, who has donated monthly for the last three months. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. There you'll find a donation button, links to all our social media, and other ways to contact us. You can also support us by signing up for a 30-day free trial of audible.com. We get financial support, and you get a free audiobook. It's a win-win situation, so head to www.audibletrial.com mcp and sign up to help us out. We really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.